Hello, everyone, and welcome to Voices of Computer Science lecture. My name is Klaus, and in this lecture, I'm going to introduce computer science professionals in different fields to give you a broad view of the many ways that people do amazing work with computers and information systems. Today, I am talking with Diego Aranha, who is an associate professor of systems security in Aarhus University in Denmark. He works in cryptography, election security, and application security. Diego graduated from Brazil, in fact, from the same university as myself. Thank you very much, Diego, for, for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to participate. Yeah, yeah uh, Diego, uh, I gave you a very brief introduction, but would you like to introduce yourself a bit more, maybe talk about uh, things that I forgot? Um, well, I'm, I'm an academic, as you, right, for uh, many years now. So I've worked uh, many years as a professor at Brazilian universities. Two years mm -hmm. ago, I moved to Denmark. Right. Um, and my, my main research is on what we call cryptographic engineering. Cryptographic this, engineering, okay, yeah. Mm. Yeah, which is this challenge of not only designing mm -hmm. uh, cryptographic systems or cryptographic protocols, but techniques to deploy them securely in practice. So you don't worry only about security proofs or abstract models, but also how the uh, software runs on some imperfect CPU. We, we, we heard uh, or we read on the news all this Spectre meltdown stuff on Intel CPUs, for example, right? Uh -huh. So what can you do as an implementer of a cryptographic system to protect your implementation from those kinds of uh, side defects introduced by uh, the CPU? That's one, one challenge. So um, maybe some of the students are not familiar with the Spectrum Meltdown. Can you talk very briefly what was it if the student has not heard about this before and why it's important? Yes, so um, Spectrum Meltdown are a family of vulnerabilities on um, CPUs discovered by academics and people from industry. Actually, simultaneously, many people in the planet actually were tracking down those when they finally uh, discovered the flaws. So there were flaws that, uh, that leak to user land processes a state that should be secret. So for example, one process running the CPU can figure out what another process is doing. And if you think about cryptography, that's extremely important because you could have one process operating with a cryptographic key, a secret, in a different process trying to leak information from this target victim process to figure out, oh, is this, is this key, um, does it look like this? Or is the bit being processed now, is it a one? Mm -hmm. So by leaking this kind of information, we call this a side channel attack. Um, this this uh, malicious process can figure out uh, secrets, private data, uh, and, and break isolation, the isolation that should happen between these two processes running on the CPU. Okay, um, so when did uh, so? What was the target of this attack that were, that you talked about? Uh, so, Spectre meltdown. They target yes. the cache uh, hierarchy. They target the uh, speculative execution engine. So, they, they attack hardware components. Mm -hmm. um, some of them um, were actually um, mitigated by by uh, firmware updates and, and software patches. But mm -hmm. ultimately, the hardware is flawed, which is hard to, of course, to fix this definitely. Okay, if we go uh, one step back, okay, so uh, cryptographic engineering, and you talk about how to design secure systems. Um, let's talk, go from the point of view of a uh, computer science student that is starting to study cryptographic engineer. What are the first uh, topics that this student is going to study, uh, wants to know about, to, to learn about this topic? Um, yeah, great question. I would say computer architecture. Uh huh. Um, of course, you need a good background on math, uh, especially discrete math, number theory, algebraic geometry for elliptic curves. Mm -hmm. you, need, you, you need some background in math, but I would say what makes a difference for uh, a computer science professional working both on academia and industry is a deep understanding on how the computer architecture works. Because the challenge is to translate uh, properties you have, again, on the abstract models, the properties you have on the mathematical objects, uh, the guarantees you get from security proofs um, about the, the protocols, reducing, for example, let's imagine uh, a digital signature scheme, right? So some, mm -hmm. some mathematician, some cryptographer uh, designs a scheme for computing digital signatures. And uh, the, the challenge for the designer is how can I design a scheme such that they can prove afterwards that to break the signature scheme, 
the attacker, a malicious party, necessarily needs to break some hard problem, to, to solve some hard problem, uh, to break a hardness assumption. Right? That, that's the terminology we use. Mm -hmm. So if you can do this, you prove that, oh, this signature scheme is actually uh, as secure as this hardness assumption. Um, so if, if we fail to, to solve this hardness assumption for a long time, you, you can think of factoring, integer factoring. That's a problem that uh, doesn't have an efficient solution for uh, hundreds of years. So if that problem is hard, you can build a signature scheme that depends on factoring to be secure. Then you can prove on an abstract model that, well, this scheme is secure given the hardness of integer factoring. Now comes the crypto uh, engineer, and mm -hmm. he needs to write a signature scheme, an implementation of the signature scheme, typically on a combination of a high level language and a lower level language mm -hmm. uh, for speed in a way that even if uh, other processes running on the same machine are trying to actively attack uh, the signature process to leak the, the private key that's using for the signatures, this cannot be done with uh, more than negligible probability. Mm -hmm. so, so you had an abstract model in which this was proven secure. Now the challenge is to write software using you know, human-made programming languages, compilers, tool chains, operating systems, computer architecture, full of bugs we don't know yet. And, and you need to preserve those guarantees. So yeah, here's a question. So you start with a cryptographic model that describes a secure software. And then you have to think about how you implement this secured software in an application that will be used to a human. Uh, yeah. We are talking right now about what level of software? Are we talking about operating system level software? Are we talking about application level software? Uh, are we talking about firmware level software? Um, interesting question because cryptography can uh, appear, mm -hmm. can come up on all three. Oh, really? You can have cryptography mm -hmm. on a higher level when, for example, we write, I don't know, JavaScript running on the browser. Yes. Um, it's common to deploy cryptographic algorithms there as well. You might mm -hmm. want to encrypt something on the client side. You might want to uh, hash a password yeah. on the client side for authentication. All of these are in a fairly high uh, abstraction layer, right? They're running on the virtual mm -hmm. uh, machine, the JavaScript virtual machine running on the browser. Yeah. At the same time, you could have disk encryption, encrypting your hard disk, or you could have a VPN connection that's maintained by the kernel. Now, suddenly you have cryptography running on the operating system level. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, some of the computational cost of uh, encrypting data or packets uh, to be sent to the network could be offset to your uh, network interface. And then there could be hardware running on the network interface uh, supported by firmware, of course, that's running cryptographic algorithms again. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's beautiful about cryptography is that it's really everywhere. Uh, talking about be uh, cryptography being everywhere, um, so how is the situation like? I saw that you gave recently a lecture where your students had to find uh, security vulnerabilities in services that they used every day. So like the services that we use every day, how much full of security bugs are they? Um, can I just say it's improving? Okay. So, uh, it's, it's hard to measure, right? It's hard to quantitatively um, mm -hmm. measure this. But, but um, if you look at the internet, for example, now, yes. now we have um, good, uh, a good estimate that around 90% of um, web traffic is encrypted. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, pre-Snowden mm -hmm. times, um, mm -hmm. this was less than half of the internet traffic, mm -hmm. of the, the web traffic. Mm -hmm. So we had lots of HTTP websites still lying around. Mm -hmm. and, and after Snowden, there was this push of uh, deploying you know, SSL and TLS mm -hmm. everywhere. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. And now uh, there was this recent announcement that Google measures more than 95% of the web traffic being encrypted. Mm -hmm. So in a time span of what, eight years, uh, we got the, the, the web encrypted. We, I mean, the collective yes. um, you know, community of people working on the topic. Mm -hmm. so, so then that's one problem solved. But at the same time, then you wonder how good these TLS configurations are. Are they really up to date? Are, really, they, are they really using uh, state-of-the-art algorithms? Or maybe some of them are supporting very old versions of the protocols because perhaps they expect a client uh, from the 90s to arise running, I don't know, Internet Explorer 4 <laughs> and attempting a connection. And you need to preserve legacy uh, compatibility with those clients. Mm -hmm. So a challenge is even though you upgrade 
connections to encrypted, there are different levels of encryption. Not all encryption um, schemes are the same, mm -hmm. right? So when um, I taught this, this course, I taught network security in the fall semester last year. Mm -hmm. um, the final project was, was uh, instructing the students. Well, we, we spent the whole course learning about different encryption mm -hmm. and security technologies. But the final project was um, asking them to select an application that they uh, enjoy using, that it's something that collects sensitive information about mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. um, and then to perform a preliminary security analysis. That involved several aspects. One of them was exactly, oh, if this uh, app communicates with a server somewhere, which is the case, I would say, for 95, 99, even percent of the apps we run on our phones, mm -hmm. um, they are more like interfaces to cloud services than really uh, a client-side computing uh, um, heavy um, processes, right? So mm -hmm. when do they uh, talk to some server somewhere? How good is the encryption uh, established between these two? And then they were asked to measure what versions of the protocols were being used, what algorithms were being used, mm. uh, what standards were uh, actually in place, how the certificates were managed. Uh, is it possible for an adversary to try to hijack this connection and read capture traffic that's been transmitted there? So that was one angle. Another angle was reverse engineer, decompile the app and just <laughs> look for um, stuff there, look for suspicious, interesting, juicy strings. Uh, and some of them found API keys, hard-coded passwords, some secrets here and there. So you still find those. Of mm -hmm. course, when we, I taught this course, I told the students, don't pick, um, I don't know, a state-of-the-art uh, mobile app because it's quite likely you won't find anything interesting in just the span of three weeks you had to do for the project, right? And this was like an introductory course. It's not advanced um, security or system security. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so some of them were quite smart in picking something that uh, was um, apps that were not as mature, but was, would, for example, process payments. So they would deal with credit card numbers and uh, you know, financial information. And they still managed to, in several occasions, hmm. uh, to find problems, right? Privacy breaches, uh, also problems in setting up secure connections, hard-coded secrets, um, uh, data from one user that could be accessible to other users. Mm -hmm. So um, they... We had a broad range of different uh, apps and also different collections of results uh, that the students found. And one thing that I found particularly fascinating and I really wanted to do to try with them was after they delivered these projects, I read all of them, I graded all of them. Um, and then we started the vulnerability disclosure process, which is um, always fascinating. And for me, it was especially fascinating because it was the first time I would do this in Denmark. So I didn't know what the reaction would be. Um, like I, I'm a professor here for uh, what two years, um, a little more than two years. I'm suddenly writing together with students to local companies and saying, oh, your app has problems. Um, we have a report. We need a secure communication channel to deliver this report. Uh, and, and about half of the uh, contacts we made actually were successful in the sense that we oh. could deliver the report and, and get someone in the company to take a look and maybe even interact a little bit. Um, some others, we just got like automatic replies. No one bothered to reply to us, but then yeah, that's that's life. That's interesting. So uh, yeah, I, I guess that there is a lot of people in the industry that are not so uh, interested in security. That's kind of weird. Like why would a company not be interested in the security of their application? Yeah, that's puzzling, right? <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, uh, it's um, many companies still see. Uh, it's a bit incredible to think about it, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Many companies still see uh, information security as cost and not investment, mm -hmm. right? But well, it's really a long-term investment because you reduce the impact of penalties and not, um, you know, services not being online to mm -hmm. to collect revenue in the case of of a commercial uh, system. So um, in the long term, I'm biased, of course, but yeah. I would argue that having a, a proper security posture uh, is the right thing to do. And I guess if you study computer history, you get to the same conclusion. So, but I, at the same time, I understand that some of these apps came from startups that, mm -hmm. that are not as mature. So maybe they don't have a dedicated security professional on the team or even a, a dedicated careful way uh, of receiving such reports. So, um, so maybe, you know, this sits, is, some of our emails might be sitting on the inboxes of other employees that are not, don't have security as their high priority, and maybe we get a response eventually. Uh, I don't know. 
we mentioned that, okay, maybe not all companies have this awareness that security is important and that security uh, is not only a cost, but an investment. Of course, these companies are made for, by people who are computer scientists. So let's say, not, of course, not all computer scientists are security specialists, but what is, do you think it's the minimum that any computer science, even uh, who is not a security specialist, should be aware in terms of security? What's, what are the concepts, what are the ideas that any computer scientist should know in terms of security? Yeah, uh, so some things are, I would say, yes, yeah, some concepts are uh, somewhat universal. So mm -hmm. any computer scientist, in my view, should know a little bit, for example, about authentication. Mm -hmm. So most, if not all non-trivial applications out there need to do at least some kind of authentication, right? Some username, password authentication. And uh, this is surprisingly tricky to deploy right. What are the right algorithms? What should we store on the server side? If a database of those hashed passwords, we use cryptographic hash functions mm -hmm. uh, to protect those passwords. If that, that database leaks, how do you uh, actually prevent an attacker from recovering the passwords from the hashed passwords mm -hmm. and so on? That's one of the basic things. How to implement second factor authentication as well. It's super mm -hmm. important. So how to integrate with like an authenticator app or maybe even SMS messaging as a way to have an out-of-band authentication scheme to not rely strictly on username and passwords. Mm -hmm. So those are basic uh, concepts for authentication. Mm -hmm. Setting up TLS also is very important. Again, mm -hmm. as computer scientists, we need to uh, what frequently- are, What are TLS? Could you set it Yes, up? of course. TLS is transport layer security. It's okay. the, a protocol that encrypts uh, basically all connections over the mm -hmm. internet, um, which um, programmers usually Inter, uh, interface with it through libraries, right? Or through even pro, uh, basic native programming language support. Mm -hmm. But for the protocol to be successful or to establish a secure connection, there are some assumptions. So you need to provide, you know, a certificate, you need to verify a certificate mm -hmm. uh, from the server side that's valid. And, and, and there are several uh, configuration tuning parameters that actually depend on the client's behavior. Mm -hmm. So when you set up a connection like this on the, um, on the client, on the app, it needs to be careful, mm -hmm. uh, carefully set up. So that's another thing that I would say all um, programmers, not necessarily computer scientists, but everyone writing software should be very uh, aware about. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the basic um, security measures of the programming language and platform of choice you're using. Mm -hmm. If you are writing code for Android or if you're writing code for, I don't know, uh, using Rust as a modern programming language or Go mm -hmm. or Java, or, uh, or even C, which is not great for uh, security. Really? But yeah, so well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We can talk Why about would that, that be? <laughs> yeah. So, but you need to be aware of the pitfalls, right? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, especially for the more classical programming languages, the tooling that's a also a collective failure of uh, the community of developers worldwide, uh, the tooling doesn't help too much the programmer to write secure code. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have, for example, insecure functions in C that mm -hmm. do not raise warnings when compiled using GCC or Clang. And, and I find that a bit, uh, you know, uh, underwhelming to, to say the least. What, so what kind of warnings are we talking about? That's actually very interesting. Like what, what, what uh, you say that like secret problems, if GCC itself? Not with GCC, but mm -hmm. C code um, written by programmers that could uh, that could be risky, dangerous, or vulnerable, right? You mean like leaking memories or leaking memories as a resource exhaustion mm -hmm. attack, right? Because this, if there is a server leaking memory every time it processes a request by the clients, it's very easy for an attacker, for example, to just set up many transactions right. and just exhaust memory server. Server enters in swap space and spends all time like jumping through disk and memory. So mm -hmm. that's a denial of service attack. Yeah. Uh, but you can imagine some more dangerous attacks. Uh, for example, um, C strings are notoriously hard to process, right? Mm. Because you only figure out the end of the string when you reach it, right? The no right. byte at the end. And from a security perspective, that's the worst possible desi design decision ever. That was related, that, uh, there was a very famous bug about that about 10 years ago. It was the Heartbleed bug was related to C-Strings. Heartbleed, it? yes. Heartbleed, um, perhaps Heartbleed is a perfect example. So Heartbleed is, um, is a vulnerability in which the client would ask the server mm -hmm. 
-hmm. to return a strings into the client. So it implemented, uh, it, it, the vulnerability was found on a heartbeat uh, component that actually keeps a connection alive, even mm -hmm. when there is no traffic. Mm -hmm. So a client would send uh, from time to time a new uh, message saying, oh, I'm just, I'm alive. And I would check that, I want to check that the server is alive or the other endpoint is alive. Mm -hmm. So I'm sending you random bytes. Please give me the same random bytes back. Mm -hmm. So if the server is alive, of course, the server will uh, reproduce what was uh, received from the client. Um, and this gives freshness. So you, you can check that this is the actual server running because the same bytes you sent, you came back. However, the length um, of, of these fields were specified in the messages and were processed wrong. So the client could say something like, I'm sending you 10 bytes, but I'm telling the server that I'm sending 500. And the server would return 500 bytes instead of the 10 bytes uh, that came from the client. So this, the client could get a piece of memory from the server which at first doesn't look dangerous at all, but if you mm -hmm. imagine that, you know, uh, if the client can build the whole profile and there were uh, proof of concept attacks on the internet that the client could actually collect gigabytes of memory from the server and reconstruct the server memory, there you find passwords, cryptographic keys, database records, private information, all sorts of stuff that servers is storing in RAM memory. So um, yeah, so that was a, a bad decision or a bad design uh, handling strings. Mm -hmm. uh, there is even more dangerous stuff in the sense that the client can send a maliciously crafted string that will overflow memory on the server and run arbitrary code chosen by the client on the server that could do all sorts of uh, also nasty stuff. So that, that's what we refer to as buffer overflow attacks. Mm -hmm. And they are a direct, essentially a direct consequence of uh, how the um, string interface in C works. Another issue that is also important is the issue of um, privacy. So yep. what could you talk about? Like what are kind of um, knowledge that uh, professionals in computer science should uh, be aware of to, uh, when dealing about issues of privacy? Yes, great question. Um, so, so privacy is a bit um, tricky as a concept because the mm -hmm. definition varies a lot and has yeah. cultural uh, undertones. And, right. and it's what's private in Brazil is not what's private in Japan, it's not right. what's private in, in Denmark, right? But there are some universal, uh, of course, shared mm -hmm. uh, technical aspects here. Mm -hmm. So uh, things that one should be aware of, right? What are the, uh, first, the privacy standards uh, or the privacy regulation in the country you're deploying this? Mm -hmm. because you need to be compliant, of course, otherwise risk fining or, or other kinds of penalties. Uh, also, minimize the amount of data that should be collected as, again, um, computer scientists uh, and maybe as an industry that drives on data stored from other people. Uh, we have this tendency of trying to maximize the amount of data we collect about users, about systems. Um, we, we tend to increase the size of databases that applications and servers store because we might monetize that data somehow. But of course, that's not a good privacy posture. Mm -hmm. To give one simple example, I was uh, actually making an appointment for my son to get a haircut yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I had to give uh, his name and his birth date. And I was wondering, why is that useful for a haircut, right? So <laughs> right. probably some designer or some programmer, it's a simple example, but some programmer there thought that it was a good idea, but that's one data point that's being collected. It's actually a bit of private information. It's, right. it's personal information, not the most sensitive ever, but certainly um, some, some personal uh, information that's being collected without any uh, actual need. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would um, really like uh, developers and designers of systems uh, from, from this point on to, to practice data minimization mm -hmm. uh, or data right. collection minimization. Collect just was strictly needed to provide the service that this application is standard to. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you need to collect private information, um, em employ and learn about uh, the, the anonymity or pseudonymity techniques that we can use. So uh, differential privacy is one, k anonymity is another. So you store records in a database in a way that, again, if they leak, they don't reveal as much information uh, about the users as was collected in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, now we're going to get cl to close this first part of the interview where we talk about your research topic. One last question. Let's say that someone listen about this and oh, 
security is interesting and I want to know more, what would be your recommendation of like the book that a newbie in security should read to learn more about that? Cool. Yeah. What's what's great also about computer security uh, or information security, if we get the broader angle, is that it's a huge field mm -hmm. with um, stuff for everyone. So you get operating system security, which is isolation between processes. Yes. And you have cryptography, which is applied math for encryption, digital signatures, and so on. And you could have software security, which is someone you know trying to find and exploit and fix vulnerabilities in software. You have hardware um, security, designing security mechanisms in hardware. You have computer architecture uh, things. Maybe you want to encrypt memory of your of the, of the uh, microcontroller you deploy on the field because you are afraid of the, the attacker extracting data from memory. So so then it becomes a hardware security issue. You have software engineering. Some people you know. Uh, worry about uh, procedures and how humans can um, mislead, uh, deceive other humans into uh, acting on non-secure ways. So that's social engineering. Mm -hmm. So um, operational security, how to uh, design, develop procedures that uh, resist against these kinds of attacks. So it's a very, very broad field. And I would say I, I'm conjecturing that it's impossible to not find anything that is interesting there for everyone in, in at least computer yeah. science. So if you are more math inclined and you go to cryptography, if you are more, um, if you are more um, alternative uh, or creative thinking, maybe social engineering and, and uh, the human layer is much more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really like low level stuff, computer architecture is there waiting for you. Software security and exploitation is there as well, reverse engineering too. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit for everyone. Books I like. I really like um, Ross Anderson's book. Um, I think the latest version is called Security Engineering. He has some of the chapters on his uh, website, and it gives a, a very broad perspective uh, about the field again, because he talks a little bit about cryptography, about you know national security and intelligence services, um, deploying security on I don't know uh, um, nuclear um, reactor. Uh, Planes, right? And, and because that's also critical infrastructure. So there is right. a little bit of everything there. Again, it's a very broad book. For the ones who like or who are interested in cryptography, which I know Japan is also very strong on as a, as a research um, community, um, I really recommend the Coursera uh, courses on cryptography by Dame Bonner. Mm -hmm. So I think it's cryptography one, and we have been waiting for a few years for crypt cryptography two, <laughs> which is the more advanced follow-up course. But it's a great introduction because you know you you um, take the courses as you uh, as you go, and and you can do some practical exercises. And he's great at um, explaining the basic concepts. So that's always what I recommend as the first, um, at least as, as a first uh, test um, to check if you if you really are interested into digging deeper or not. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So we talked a lot about research and that's super important. But another goal of this course is also to show who are the uh, who are the researchers? Who are the professionals in computer science? How did they get here? Because uh, there, a lot of our students, they are still looking out for the fields. And I like to tell stories of people so they can identify. Uh, I think we can begin a little bit from the beginning. What was, when was the first time that you used a computer? Jim? Oh, yeah, I was <laughs> fairly old. Um, I think oh, really? I was in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I knew I wanted to do, that's weird, but I knew I wanted to do computer science before I had the chance to, to use a computer. Oh, really? The first contact I had with uh, computers in any form were okay. my, my parents would subscribe to, um, um, it was a like serial encyclopedia called Discovery. I don't know if you remember this from our childhoods in, 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 in Brazil. It's, so the serial encyclopedia, was it digital or was it paper? It was paper. You okay. you had to go to you know to to the uh, to the bookstore every week and get yeah. the, the weeks or the month uh, monthly uh, issue. I, I okay. don't really remember uh, how frequent it was, uh -huh. but it had stuff about everything. Uh, you know, but but there was a um, strong component or a strong emphasis on science. Mm -hmm. In one particular issue, um, there was a huge poster that you would like fold eight times with mm -hmm. basic code, coding the basic programming language. 
And I, I remember unfolding that and seeing those commands, uh, of course, writing some, some piece of software for doing something, which I couldn't read because my English at the time was also non-existent. <laughs> um, but I, I saw that and I, I immediately decided, this looks cool. I want to do this. I don't know what this does, but I, that's what I want to do. So, um, which in the case was programming, right? For this mm -hmm. uh, abstract uh, programming language, I couldn't even understand what we was doing. Mm -hmm. And then I, I started talking or telling people, oh, I, I, want, I want to be a programmer, uh, a system analyst, as we would call at the time in, in Brazil, right? Yeah. Um, and then when we were, I was much older than that, um, my older brother actually went to tech school for his uh -huh. high school, as a possibility you have in Brazil, for data processing, which is an mm -hmm. um, old name for just programming. Yeah, and then my parents got um, a computer at home for him to uh, to learn how to program, and that was exactly when uh, I had the, the first chance to to use a computer, uh, especially as a power user, someone who can write code for this computer. How old were you at the time? Um, let me think, uh, probably around twelve or okay. maybe older still, maybe thirteen. Okay, it was a Pentium one hundred and um 66 megahertz a or maybe 166 wow yeah but i skipped like all the 486 and uh, the, the other stuff I, I moved already to a computer with uh, a sound card and 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 cd <laughs> rom drive and, and i could play games on it already you say you moved straight to a computer to a sound card but i don't think that anyone taking this course right now even True. knows yeah. uh, an age <laughs> where computers did not come with sound cards i think it's exactly, like yeah. oh wow there are are there computers without sound cards? Yeah, That's but at the time you yes. could buy a computer, right? Without sound and you actually yes. bought this. It was um, uh, it was always happiness when this happened. And uh, you got like, uh, you would get the sound card, the CD drive and a pack of 10 uh, CD games, right? That right. you could now suddenly play and, and configure every one of them, the sound card, we had to configure them manually. You, you provided the IRQ, uh, you know, the address space uh, to map the, the IO commands. You had to, to write a game specific, sound card specific configuration for any of them to run. Wow. But anyways, that's that's how I, where I started programming. My, my mm -hmm. brother started coding. He uh, started coding in the Pascal programming language. Yeah. And I, of course, piggybacked and, and tried to learn as much as possible. Um, and then when I had the, the and then I loved coding. I, I always yeah. loved coding. It's something I still do almost mm -hmm. every day. Um, no, no matter how hard it is sometimes to, you know, uh, to make it compatible with uh, an academic uh, career. But uh, if I don't code, I get depressed. So, um, and then when I had the chance to pick my undergrad, of course, computer science was the obvious choice. So let me ask you, so you, you love to code. Uh, so when you, you said that when you were a kid, what would you code? You talk about coding, about like setting up the computer to use the sound card. What else, other sorts of programs did you do? Yeah, I, I remember writing quiz games. Um, quiz, okay. And, and, and I remember one thing in particular, I, I, I was I, for a time obsessed with quiz games. Uh, and it's exactly when I discovered uh, arrays because my first quiz game was like copy and paste 10 times uh, the basic logic to, you know, print uh, a question on the screen and collect an answer and check if it's correct or not. <laughs> but after you copy and paste that uh, maybe 10, 15 times, your, your piece of software is already not maintainable anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember going back to my, my brother and asking, oh, I, is there a smarter way to do this? I don't see how to do this. And then he didn't know at the time because he was taking his first course on computer programming as well. And then I told him, go to your teacher and ask him uh, <laughs> what, what we should do, what I should do to fix this. And he comes mm -hmm. back and says, oh, you need to use arrays. <laughs> so, I, I, <laughs> so I had like a new version with arrays of strings and, and so on. So I guess uh, you you lo you loved programming and you talked to your brother and you both programmed together and you did say that you decided to enter computer science. At what point did you think, oh, I well, I want to be not only a computer scientist or a computer professional, but I want someone who works with information security. Um. This was about halfway through my uh, undergrad mm -hmm. degree. Uh, I was, uh, at the time, I was very much uh, interested into distributed systems, mm -hmm. uh, which is the field of uh, how to design protocols for multiple machines to reach consensus, mm -hmm. um, in, 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 if I give a short definition. 
So I had a, a good friend at my undergrad who was uh, interested in computer security and I was interested in uh, distributed systems. And then we took the operating systems uh, course and some, some were, um, during that course, we actually swapped our interests. So I became interested in uh, data security and he went for distributed systems. And actually he did a PhD in distributed systems and I did the PhD in cryptography. So for <laughs> some reason we flipped bits there and we, we ran in our own, we, we pursued these this different careers. Uh, and at the time, one thing that was striking, interesting uh, for me was in, in information security or computer security is this exercise on uh, both alternating between a design role and an attacker role. Mm -hmm. So anyone working in information security is not sufficient just to try to design something or the only way to design something that's secure against an attacker is actually to learn how uh, the attacker thinks. And for me, this, this um, self um, reducibility property, I don't know how to describe this, or this, this uh, dichotomy, uh, maybe that's a better word, um, it was always fascinating. I can both play, uh, let's say, good guy, right? In the bad sense guy. of designing something, but also bad guy, breaking stuff and, and, and proving that it's insecure. I think one thing that is cool about that part of security, like playing the good guy and playing the bad guy, I believe they're like security is famous for having many events where people get together to do this sort of attack and defense. Uh, do you have any good, ex did, did you start to participate with them already as a student or was that after you, so what is your experience with that? Yeah, I, I didn't, especially at the time I graduated, there wasn't many opportunities oh, really? for that. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, there is a huge global CTF, Capture the Flag community. Mm. It's also a great resource for people who, who, wants, to, uh, who want to learn. CTF, uh, right? Yeah, so mm -hmm. these CTF competitions, they run essentially on weekends, uh, oh, at really? least the biggest ones. Uh, so you have, if you don't have a life, it's great because you spend the whole weekend, like they last sometimes 48 hours mm -hmm. and you, you spend all this time solving challenges as a team, right? So it's, it's great, uh, time consuming, but very fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you can, you know, there are problems about uh, crypto, uh, software security, exploitation, reverse engineering, all these, these different uh, fields I, I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great place uh, to start. So... At the time I did my undergrad and then even halfway through my PhD, I didn't know much about the existence of these competitions. They were not as popular. Uh -huh. They already existed in the big events like DEF CON and Black Hat, but these mm -hmm. were done in person uh, during the conferences. So I, I didn't have a chance to attend them mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Uh, but then after I graduated my PhD, I became faculty. I had a chance, a few chances to, to also uh, play um, not exactly CTFs, but uh, participating in security challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them that still I still um, in a way pay the price for was participating in the security uh, challenge uh, revolving the Brazilian voting system, mm -hmm. where we had the, um, the opportunity to show several vulnerabilities in the system under very restricted uh, working conditions. Uh, and it was a great way for me to exercise my uh, uh, attacker role, which yeah. is important to improve my defender designer role. I yes, uh, I, I saw your work on the on this on the challenge for the Brazilian voting security system. Uh, I saw that you managed to make the the machine that allow you to vote for Darth Vader, which was uh, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, that's uh, just going. I, I, maybe I'll go back to that, but just going one step back, and you mentioned that you became an academic. So, I mean, of course, there is a huge area for people in security to go for different companies. And what made you, did you spend a lot of time thinking, do you want to be an academic or do you want to go to the industry? And, and what helped you make that decision? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, I remember when I, I finished my undergrad, I got a job as a trainee at the company, right? Uh, well, mm -hmm. before, of course, this was before I graduated, otherwise I wouldn't be a trainee. And I worked there for one year, it was a crypto mm -hmm. company in the capital of Brazil, Yeah, where I did my undergrad. Um, and, and I remember not liking it very much, um, not because the company was bad per se or had bad management or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I was already too rebellious to have a boss. Okay. <laughs> So I, I was like, okay, this um, I, this makes no sense, right? I'm I'm sitting here writing lots of code, and 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 one guy across the, the room is just supervising what I do. He's just managing mm -hmm. me. 
right? And and uh, and well, he's acting bossy because he's the boss, right? Uh, and that maybe that has a little bit um, in relationship to the company. They were uh, facing some um, financial issues at the time, mm -hmm. so they actually laid off everyone but me because I was oh, wow. a cheap employee. So I had <laughs> I was the sole programmer, and there were three bosses, the three guys who <laughs> owned the company. So okay. I I was receiving like all these random requests from different projects from all these guys and then at some point i said uh, that that's not that's not i don't right. like this anymore, you don't want right? to be a boss you, you, want, you yeah. want to work yeah of course of course um there is this is not distinct or this is uh, it's pretty distinct from most people's experience uh on the industry now you can really have the opportunity to work for you know google facebook uh entity in japan great companies that do uh that have much better working conditions i would say mm -hmm. but that was the experience i was exposed to at the time and then uh, i i thought okay i don't want to be bossed around um that much anymore i'm too rebellious for that i'm too anti maybe too anti-authority you could even say so um so i should try something else and then um some of my other uh friends from from school uh from the university were applying for master uh, programs and then i thought why not let's try that so then I applied for uh, Unicamp, the University of Campinas, where uh, you, you also uh, graduated from, mm -hmm. um, and then got the, the possibility of studying cryptography there. Um, and I applied to a few schools, and, and I selected that in particular because uh, the researcher working on cryptography there had um, co-authored papers with someone who authored the book I used on my undergrad course on cryptography. So I was like, oh. Uh, interesting so if i work i can work with someone who worked with that guy who wrote the textbook and he must be very smart because you know right. the textbook is pretty good so then i moved there i i did my master's uh, with julio lopez uh, my mm -hmm. advisor there i moved into my phd uh, working with him again and the great thing was uh i had this possibility of spending one year abroad so i, I went to canada to work with the guy who wrote the handbook uh, that we used as textbook during the undergrad years. So, so you did it's what like you did. Yeah, you yeah. worked with the guy that you, you wanted to work with the, the guy who wrote the textbook and you managed to work with the guy who worked with the textbook. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Working with someone who inspired me in the first place, right? Yeah. So it was, in a yeah. sense, uh, closing a loop. Can I, can I stop you for a second? I think that's really great. I mean, I, I, I always ask like in, for my students, like who inspired them and ch think about who isp inspired them. Uh, because I think that's super important if you want to be an academic, if you want to be a researcher, to, to, to have these kind of inspirations. Can you talk a little bit about who inspires you in general, maybe like two or three people that inspire you? Yep. So uh, the, the person I'm referring to is Alfred Menezes. Uh -huh. uh, he's a photographer at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm also very much inspired by um, a researcher called uh, Mike Scott. He's retired now. He worked in Ireland for many years. Mm -hmm. And, and I always took him as a role model in the sense that he could balance very well theory and practice. So I always aimed at that he would uh, speak fluently about the mathematical objects he was playing with uh, when uh, applying uh, them for cryptography, but never losing uh, the ground, right? Never losing uh, realities requirements. So I always admire that. Uh, another researcher uh, that inspires me a lot on the voting system stuff is, is uh, Alex Halderman. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Michigan, and he has performed security analysis of several voting systems uh, uh, across the planet. And well, I have to say he didn't make uh, many friends out of this experience, but he, he writes great papers about uh, those. And uh, when I was suddenly through on this voting machine uh, security business, actually his research was uh, was very inspiring and a guiding path mm -hmm. for me to understand how I should behave and what should I look for and how I should report these uh, results resp responsibly as well. So that's great um, because that brings me, I mean, probably my two closing questions. One of the reasons that I invited you and, and you mentioned this on the people that inspired you, like you're very famous in Brazil because like you said, your experience with the voting system where you criticized the, the voting system in Brazil and the people said, and you got into conflict with several people because of that. And then you talk about your students that also analyzed the, the vulnerabilities in the companies and sometimes they contact the companies and they didn't want to know that. And you talked about your inspiration people who also criticized vulnerabilities and also they didn't make friends about that um 
Also, I imagine we all know about companies that try to hide their securities. So, and we also have, of course, Snowden that got into conflict with the government of the United States because he was uh, divulging like security information related to how the uh, United States is spied on a lot of people. Um, so we see over and over again this issue of like a computer scientist, a cryptographer, a security engineer, like learning of something and getting to fight to make sure that this information is known. So do you see that as a whole, uh, as, as a part of the role of someone in academia, someone doing research? What do you think of like, how far should people go to talk about the, what they believe in? That, that's a great question because of course it touches on ethical mm -hmm. uh, principles, right? So uh, I would say, yeah, every security uh, professional needs to constantly think about uh, ethical concerns. If uh, the work being done is conducted uh, ethically, if the results are being reported ethically, um, if you know proper uh, best practices are being used, not only for analyzing or, or deriving the technical results, but especially to reporting those back to society. So I understand this is the role of the security professional to mm -hmm. disclose this to both companies, but also to, to the society, because, well, in many cases we are discussing society actually funded the initiatives producing those systems. The voting system is a great example. This is paid with taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. So I understand that society uh, is, is uh, uh, entitled to uh, learn very precisely how good the system is. It's actually their investment, their long-term investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's not easy. Sometimes um, the, there is some hostility. Sometimes uh, researchers, I would say even that the, uh, this is improving with time. If you look at the beginning of the century, you would see uh, companies suing researchers, right? Mm -hmm. Moving this to the legal grounds. And then uh, it's quite tricky because in many cases, an academic doesn't have the resources to defend um, him or herself in court uh, after such uh, allegations, I would say that 20 years after I started keeping track of this, it has improved in the sense that companies are more uh, receptive. Sometimes, even when they are hostile, they don't go to court. Uh, but that doesn't, of course, um, say that we shouldn't act responsibly and with ethic, yeah. ethics in mind. So Thank you very much, Diego. And there's a lot of things that I would love to ask you more. And I think we could talk for a lot of time, but we're kind of on the limit for our talk today. So I would just like to thank you for taking this time to talk to us. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It was very fun. Um, it was great seeing you again. Yeah. And um, if any of your students want to learn more and want to uh, have references and pointers, um, they can just contact me. Okay.